Hi everybody, um, my name is Fajosopoulos and um, this is going to be a tutorial um, uh, introducing machine learning using R. In this instance, we will be using um, the Galaxy interface um, to do the analysis, uh, but um, specifically what we will be using is the R Studio um, interactive environment that is available um, through uh, use Galaxy. Um, just before we start, um, a, a few things um, that you need to be aware of. Um, the first is uh, for those who want to see how you can start our studio, there is a dedicated tutorial on the Galaxy Training Network um, that explicitly uh, describes this information. Um, you can find this under the uh, Using Galaxy and Managing Your Data um, section. Additionally, as we will be using a lot of R, uh, in this tutorial, um, you can always find more um, information on, on, on how to write code in R. And um, the Galaxy Train Network helps is also some lessons around R, uh, specifically under the introduction to Galaxy Analysis. Um, and you can find R basics and advanced R in Galaxy there. Um, also, um, I need to highlight that um, the uh, information, the tutorial that you're going to be going through now uh, is also available through um, the Galaxy Train Network. Um, and it's largely based on the material that has been produced by, um, by Elixir in order to address uh, machine learning um, needs for life sciences. So um, without any further ado, uh, let's get started. So as you can see, I have created a new um, history in, in Galaxy called Introduction to Machine Learning in R. Um, it has only one entity, which is blinking, and you see it's running, and it's called RStudio. And just to provide some quick context, if I uh, search for RStudio here, um, you'll see that there's going to be um, this new um, tool here that you can click Execute. And this means that you have, you're going to find this particular um, aspect here. But um, if you want to access it, uh, you need to go to user and active interactive environments, and you'll see um, that our studio is actually running here uh, for about an hour. Uh, clicking on the um, link here, um, a new tab will open that's going to be the actual R studio server. And this is where we're going to be um, doing our um, analysis today. So um, the R Studio environment, again, a very quick overview. Uh, it comprises um, these three panels. I'll open yet another one, which is going by file, new file, and R script. Um, and now this is a more traditional perspective of R Studio. Here is where our script will take place, our code. And this is the console where the output of R is going to be printed at all times. Um, this is our environment where all our variables and objects are going to be listed. And here's going to be a, a listing of the files. This is the file stub that you're seeing. Uh, additional plots will be able to be uh, viewed here. So um, a first thing that needs to be um, uh, discussed is that we will be using uh, a few um, libraries that are necessary uh, for us to, um, to, to use. Um, and uh, all the commands are going to be available um, on the material itself. And it might take some time to actually run those commands in your uh, particular interface. So um, I'm going to highlight all those things and click run. Uh, and you'll see some red uh, letters being written here. Um, at this time, it might be nice to pause the tutorial until all the commands have been, all the libraries have been successfully installed. You can find, you can verify that the, um, the commands are uh, the tools that the libraries are uh, successfully installed by actually checking um, the libraries. So I'm going to be loading all those packages here. Again, I'm going to run here and you'll see uh, some printing out things. Um, I'm going to zoom this a bit more. Um, so the one is, uh, the top one is um, CTB biplot, and then we have the Tidyverse, uh, Gali, Carré, Gmodels, Rpart, Random Forest, Dead Extend, and then ML3, EdgeR, and Lima. As you can see, not all the red words are mostly informative, there are no errors. So if you can reach this point, it means that you're good to go, and then we can continue from here onwards. 
So now that you have successfully loaded your libraries, the first thing they're going to do, I'm going to press a few address here. Um, actually, before we start, um, as you can see here, it's, this is un still untitled. So I'm going to um, save this as a script. I'm going to put it as intro to MLR. I'm going to save this and you can see here that the actual script has been, um, is now available and, and we don't need to worry if we actually um, lose this. You can always um, save this locally by downloading this um, as an export uh, to your um, local folder, and then you can always run it um, at your um, own RStudio instance. So, and the first thing we're going to do is actually load some, some data. And uh, for this purpose, we are going to be using the breast cancer uh, data set, uh, Wisconsin, it's a diagnostic data set, and I'm going to retrieve this from the UCI machine learning repository. Um, in order to do that, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, um, uh, again, I'm going to be ex absolutely explicit and I'm going to, first of all, um, load the library again, the Tideverse, which we're going to be um, requiring. And then uh, let me resize this a bit more. I'm going to use the read underscore CSV function and in which I will provide the complete URL of the UCI dataset. As you can see, it's a breast cancer Wisconsin dataset um, so that I can load it up. And I'm going to also use the secondary um, dataset that has the actual column names so that we can have a more efficient way of dealing with that. Um, so right now, um, is um, it's running on the background. Uh, it's retrieving the data set. And now you can see uh, that we have these two new objects here. Um, you should be able to have 569 observations across 32 variables. Um, we're going to be talking a bit about this a bit more. And this is um, another single column um, um, data frame with 32 observations. So basically what we have is on, on one hand, um, we have um, the information about uh, the data itself. This is the breast cancer data. The other is the breast, col breast cancer data column names. So the first thing that I need to do is um, essentially to uh, move, to copy um, the column names uh, into our breast cancer so that we can actually use these um, and use the names. If I see the names of the columns of the variables of the original data set, the breast cancer data set, it's like X1, X2, X3, X4, which is not really informative as we have no idea what this is all about. Um, the column names actually have more um, relevant names. So in this case, as you can see, I've just executed by pressing Control Enter or um, Command Enter if, you, if you're on Mac. Um, and um, now we can have a look into how our, our data actually looks like. So I'm going to run this and uh, let me size this a bit more. So now we have a table. So basically a very short uh, snippet of our data set. And we see now that we have more meaningful column names. ID is our first column and then we have diagnosis, radius mean, texture mean, perimeter mean, and so forth. So all of our variables now have more information that we can utilize. So what we have seen so far is essentially to, to load the data. Um, it's an interesting point to highlight that, um, as you can see, um, these columns that have numbers actually are identified as double, so it's numerical ones. The diagnosis one is a character one. So good enough, a good practice usually is to convert um, our target columns. In our case, we want essentially to create somehow a model at some point uh, that will um, rely on the diagnosis as our target. So basically we want to figure out a diagnosis based on this information. So for this reason, it might be useful to classify, to change our diagnosis as a column from a character to, um, to a factor. So in order to do that, what I will be doing is I'm going to 
um, use the diagnosis column of the breast data, the cancer data, and I'm going to transform it as a factor. So um, nothing has happened, there's no error, but now if I rerun the previous command of showing sort of a table, the top part of the, um, of the data frame, uh, we will be able to see that the actual column of diagnosis has been changed into a factor. And as you can see, um, it took a few minutes and um, this is now a, a, a factor. Right, so we have successfully loaded our data and now we are ready to go to the next step. So the first step in a machine learning process is um, usually to do a quick exploratory analysis of our, of our data. Um, so before thinking about modeling itself, it is usefully, it's usually quite useful uh, to understand, to better understand what your data is all about. There is no point in sort of creating a, a thousand layer convolutional neural network, whatever that means, um, at, at your data uh, before you even know what you're dealing with. Um, the first step that we're going to do actually is we will remove the first column of the data, uh, which is um, the identifier, the unique identifier of its um, column. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to subset our original data set uh, by selecting all the columns except the first one. So from the second up until the end. And I'm going to save this into a, um, a new into a new kind of a data frame. And we're going to have a quick look as well to see how this looks like. The question is, why do we need to do that? And as you see now, it starts with diagnosis. So the question is, why do we need to do that? Uh, the short answer is that um, the unique identifier by definition is the unique identifier of its particular um, entry. So if I try to create a model based on that, and I only want to target the diagnosis, uh, it's quite possible that the model will try to figure out a motive, if such exists, uh, between the identifiers and diagnosis. So the identifier is nothing further than a unique entry for every line. It has, it should technically have no, uh, no effect whatsoever to the diagnosis itself. So if I want to create a model, I need to ensure that only the relevant columns, or at least columns that I know prior that are completely relevant, are removed. So this is um, a, a, a first approach. So the second point is that we do have a lot of, of variables in this, um, in this data set. Um, for argument's sake, I'm going to be working on the first five. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to load up the Gali library, and I'm going to do a quick plotting of all the different pairs of the five, these five different columns um, using and the diagnosis as the color and putting some transparency as well. So this is what is, going, is actually produced. So GT pairs is a really neat uh, function because what it does, it provides a very quick overview of all the different um, aspects of, 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 the, um, of, our, uh, of our data. Please note that um, the features have widely varying centers. Um, and scales, which means um, sort of the average and the standard deviations. So essentially what we might need to do is um, in order to be more comparable um, is to actually figure out um, how to scale, center and scale all those, um, all those variables so that they are much more easy um, and relevant to compare. Again, have a look here. And if you look, for example, in um, in the radius mean, you have a scale of uh, between zero and 30. And then if you go to area mean, you go from zero to about 2,500. Um, so even if the, um, the curves look a bit similar, the actual numbers, the underlying numbers as um, a standard deviation and the mean, they're quite off. So what we're going to do, we're going to use the Kare uh, library, and specifically the preprocess function, so that we can, um, um, scale and center our, our data. So in order to do that, I'm going to load again the Kare library, and I'm going to use, first of all, um, the pre-process function. 
I'm going to provide as input the no ID data set. So the data set that I've already removed the identifier, and I'm going to apply both centering and scaling on this um, data set. So this is going to be run fast enough. And then based on that, what I'm going to do, I'm going to transform my original data set into um, a recentered and scaled version of that. Um, so this will take a second, and as soon as it's done, um, it's going to create a, um, a new uh, kind of, um, of data set. As soon as this is done, um, the next part would be to actually check whether um, the, um, there has been any impact at all um, into our underlying data. In order to do that, we will be using, um, again, kind of a summary of the first columns and to see what the impact here is. So um, this is the original data. We see that this is the di diagnosis. We have um, about um, 300 uh, benign and 212 uh, malignant cases. And then we have um, the different um, basically statistics of the first four columns. So if I do the exact same thing of on the, on the summarized data, uh, as you can see, I'm now, I'm, now, I'm now using the transformed table. We see that um, although the diagnosis stays the same, everything else has now been um, adopted. So all of them have a mean of zero. So they have been centered to zero. Um, uh, the mean and max are roughly around the same numbers, at least um, scale-wise. Um, and also the standard deviation has been adapted in order to accommodate that. Um, how about we actually visualize this and see whether visually there is any impact to that effect? So again, I'm going to use DG pairs, but instead of using um, the no identifier data set, I'm going to use a transform data set. So I'm going to run the exact same thing. And um, we're going to see a new plot here. As soon as this is done, this is taking a few seconds to process. Um, and we can also visually inspect what's going to be the difference if there is such one um, in, the, um, in, the, in, in, the, in the in the plot information. As you can see, um, and I'm switching back and forth between um, the figures now, um, you see that visually at least, all the information appears to be the same. Even the correlations, um, the numbers have not changed because the effect is not to change the actual distribution of the values, but rather um, to ensure that any comparison that's going to be performed between them um, is actually a, a bit more reasonable. And you can, as you can see now, um, the scales are much closer in terms of, of numbers. So um, this is essentially a pre-processing step um, in order to ensure that um, what we can apply, what we will apply as machine learning process is actually applied to a correct um, data set. All right, so we have done a quick exploratory analysis. We've um, figured out um, what we should apply in order to make this more comparable. Um, let's start discussing about uh, the next step. So um, the first thing that I'd like to try out is unsupervised learning. And before we get to the point, um, let me give a quick, um, very brief overview about what machine learning is. So essentially, um, machine learning is science and kind of an art of giving computers the ability to learn and make decisions from data without being explicitly programmed. That's the basic um, concept of machine learning. Um, in unsupervised learning, in essence, um, it's, um, uh, it's a machine learning task of uncovering hidden patterns and structures from unlabeled data. The key word here is unlabeled data. We don't care um, whether a particular entry um, has annotation, if you like, or not. Um, for example, a researcher might want to group their samples into distinct groups based, let's say, on their gene expression data uh, without knowing in advance what these categories are. So um, clustering, for example, is one branch of um, unsupervised learning. Um, I will touch about supervised learning in a second, um, but I will continue on with the unsupervised learning um, and talk about another aspect, which is our next step, uh, which is dimensionality reduction. Uh, in the UCI dataset that we are using right now, um, there are too many features. 
um, to, to keep track of. And again, um, in, in, in life sciences, and if we go a bit more into, into omics, uh, talking about um, 32 or 31 um, columns or variables, it's not really that much of a deal. And um, if we're talking about variables as genes, we might get a few hundred um, or a few tens of thousands um, there. So um, as we have a lot of, of features to keep track of, um, what if we could reduce the number of features while at the same time maintaining much, if not all, of the information that is captured there? So this is what um, dimensionality reduction is, is all about. Uh, the principal component analysis, or PCA, is one of the most commonly used methods of dimensional reduction. And what it does, it extracts um, the features with the largest variance. So what PCA does, um, and we are going to apply this um, directly in a second, um, is essentially a two-step process. The first step of the PCA is to decorrelate um, the data. Um, and in other words, trying to uh, apply a linear transformation of, 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 of your data, of the space that your data is. The second step is the actual dimension, dimension, dimensionality reduction. Uh, what is really happening is we transform those features that we already have, our 31 columns in this instance, into new and hopefully uncorrelated features. And these uncorrelated features, um, in the second step, step, we choose from those, or we rank them, based on the ones that have the most information about the data. So let's try to actually apply this directly. Um, and we're going to use a function, um, let me put some space here, um, called principal component, PRC comp. Um, in this instance, what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, use only the numerical variables. So essentially, I'm going to exclude the first two columns, the first one being um, the unique identifier, and the second is going to be the diagnosis. Um, and again, I start from column three up until the end. And please do note, I'm using the original data set, and I want to highlight that a principal component also has an option, inherent option, of centering and scaling the data. So um, I could either remove those options and put them as false and use um, our transformed data from before, or I can put it directly here. Um, just to make sure that you are aware of all the different options here, I explicitly put this here um, so that you um, know how this, um, this can work as well. Um, so as soon as this is done, uh, the next step is to actually um, try to see and get some information about the principal phone itself. So if this is done, I'm going to use the summary, and this is what we actually get information. So a few words about that. So this resulting table actually shows the importance of its principal component. Uh, the standard deviation, the proportion of the variance captures, as well as the cumulative proportion of the variance captured by the principal components. So the principal components themselves, PC1 to PC30 uh, down here, um, is essentially um, the underlying structure in the data. They are the directions where there is the most of the variance, the directions where the data is most spread out. This means that we can try to find the straight line that best spreads the data out when it's projected along it. So this, for example, is the, the first principal component, the straight line that shows the most substantial variance in the data. As you can see, in terms of variance, the first principal component captures about 44% of the variance itself and it all goes um, down from there. Um, so the PCA, as, as we said, is a type of linear transformation on a given data set um, that has values for a certain number of variables, which are our coordinates for a certain amount of spaces. So um, what it's, I'm, I'm trying to avoid going into too much detail of how um, the actual information works, but I'm going to provide some more information about um, what are the different information that we can extract from this? So let's have a deeper look, look into the um, actual PCA object. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to ask for the structure of the object of the principal component object that we've just created. As you can see, it comprises of five different, um, uh, five different objects. So um, the, one of them is um, the center point, 
uh, the scaling and the standard deviation of each of the original variables. So this is essentially information describing what our original variables um, look like. The second is the relationship, correlation or anti-correlation between the initial variables and the principal components. And this is the rotation, um, the rotation table. And as you can see, this is why it's 30 by 30 because it's 30 our original columns and 30 are also the principal components that have been being produced. And the final is the values of each sample in terms of the principal components. So X is essentially our transform table. And each column now of our transform table are the principal components. The first column is principal component one, principal component two, and, and so forth. So let's try to visualize the results of that. And in order to do that, I'm going to use the ggpy plot um, library uh, for, this, for this purpose. So I'm going to um, put some space here. And what I'm going to be using is um, our principal component um, analysis. I'm going to um, leave this um, without explaining a bit more for the time being. Um, I'm going to use as labels the raw names of the breast cancer. So I'm going to be using them as, as, as identifiers. Um, I'm going to highlight the different groups based on that. And let's see how this actually looks like. So this seems like a very um, dense um, plot. It actually is because the labels in its point is basically the entry, the unique um, identifier of, um, of its row of my original data set. But if, if you can have a quick look here, I'll see if I can zoom this a bit more so that it's a bit more clearer. Um, there are also additional um, rows, uh, arrows, that define how the different principal components um, are identified across those, and um, how the different original variables, I'm sorry, um, align based to the two principal components. So our first principal component is this axis, this um, principal component is this axis. And, and as you can see, there are several of them that are almost fully aligned to principal component one, and almost some that are almost fully aligned to principal component two. Additionally, you might be able to figure out that there are a lot of the original um, uh, columns, features, that are very um, aligned to each other, at least looking at this particular um, uh, projection across principal component one and principal component two. Um, as an exercise, what I would recommend is changing the parameter of this particular plot. So in this instance, I've set it to so one and two. Um, some of you may have already realized that one and two correspond to principal component one and principal component two. So it may be worth checking if you actually change those to different, var different values, how the overall structure of those um, um, features uh, may look at. Um, it might also be worth um, figuring out if you remove the labels or remove the lips and how this, um, this all works. Um, the second um, exercise that I would recommend trying out, and you can find those exercises in the um, uh, Galaxy Train Network um, tutorial itself of this, of this, um, of this tutorial. Um, you, so far, we've been using the entire table of the data, right? But how about um, we constrain ourselves? Let me uh, resize this once more. Um, there we go. Uh, how about we constrain ourselves um, to only um, the columns that have the mean um, name in them? Um, and this might be useful to highlight now at this point that uh, we have radius mean, but if I scroll a bit down, we have also radius standard error, and also we have radius worst, and, um, and I think that's it. So for each of those numerical aspect, numerical features of our, um, of our data set, you have both the mean, uh, the star error, and the worst um, and the worst value. So it may be possible, uh, we don't know that, that those are correlated one way or another. So in that sense, um, it may be worth trying out an exercise where we select only the mean values. And these are essentially columns 3 to 12, in case this is, um, this is helpful. Um, I'm not going to do that here. I'll leave it as an exercise. So I'm going to uh, move on to the next part, uh, which is um, clustering. 
So, clustering is one of the most popular techniques in unsupervised learning. Um, as the name itself suggests, clustering algorithms group a set of data points into subsets of clusters. And um, the algorithm's goal is primarily to create clusters that are coherent internally, but clearly different from each other externally. So in other words, entities that are within a, the same cluster should be as similar as possible, and entities in one cluster should be as dissimilar as possible from entities in another. So broadly speaking, there are two ways of clustering data points. And this is based on the algorithm structure and, and operation of the algorithm itself. And there are the agglomerative and the divisive ones. So the agglomerative approach begins with its observation, its record, its data point in a distinct cluster. And this is called a singleton cluster because it contains one, one data point. And successively, what it does, it merges clusters together until a particular stopping criterion is, is satisfied. A divisive uh, method is the other way around. So it starts with all data points in a single big cluster. And what it does, it's, it cuts it into multiple, it splits it until again, a stopping criterion is, is met. So essentially, um, this is the task of grouping your data points based on something about them. Um, and that something could be the closeness in, in space or any other metric that can be used. Um, also bear in mind that clustering is um, more of a tool to help you explore a data set. And by no means should it be used as an automatic way of classifying data. So um, you may not always deploy a clustering algorithm for a real world production scenario. And um, so in other words, it's, it's a single clustering alone might not always be able to give you the information that you need to, to get from, from a data set. So we're going to try, uh, to try two algorithms in place, uh, one for the agglomerative and one for the divisive, and um, uh, we will see how they work. So the most um, common one is, you, is called um, k-means. So what we're going to do, um, I'm going to use k-means as a method here, and let me create some space here. I'll put here um, clustering. And what I'm going to do first is I'm going to set seed to one. So the reason I'm doing that is so that if you do the exact same seed, any randomized output uh, will produce the exact same results between uh, my execution here and what you're going to do in, 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 your, own, um, in your own environment. So, um, k-means um, tries to cluster the data in order to minimize the variances between the clusters. So the basic idea behind k-means clustering consists of defining the number of clusters um, so that the total intra-cluster variation, um, also known as uh, within cluster variation, is minimized. Uh, there are several ones that are available. I'm going to be used um, uh, the standard one, which defines uh, the total within cluster variation as the sum of the square distances of the Euclidean distance between the items and the corresponding centroid. So again, we are going to ignore um, the classes. Um, uh, so I'm going to start from column three onwards. I'm going to expect two standard two centers and um, the end start is basically an option that attempts to um, use, let me um, make this run so that we can um, have this running. So the end start option attempts to, 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 to have multiple initial config for configurations. And what it does, it reports on the best one within the k-means function. Um, so let's have a look at what the output that has been produced actually contains. Again, I'm going to use a structure. And as you can see now, it has, again, a particular set of, of information here. Um, the cluster is a vector of integers. And the vector of integers starts from one up until k, where k is basically um, the number of, of clusters that we expect. Um, and what it does, it indicates for each data point, for each row of our data set, 
to which um, cluster it's allocated to. Uh, the second one is um, the centers. This is a matrix um, that contains um, the cluster centers. So in this particular um, case, um, we have uh, the, um, the two different um, uh, coordinates. Um, and then we have the within SS. So it's a vector of the within cluster sum of squares. And we have one component per cluster. We have the total within SS, so the total within cluster sum of squares. And finally, we have the size, which is the number of points in each particular, um, in each particular cluster. So as you can see, we have approximately 400 and something in, in the first cluster and, and, and 131 in the other one. So we have produced the clusters. So the question is, would it be possible to view the clusters? Let me change this slightly. To view the clusters as a um, compared to the principal components that we've identified before. So what I'm going to do now, and this is a bit of a, um, a combination of what we did earlier, the principal components and, and, and the cluster. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot out uh, the output of the principal components, different data points across the two components, the principal one and principal two. Uh, but I'm going to use the color of the plot as um, the cluster so that the same um, entries of the same cluster are going to be put into the same um, with the same color. And the shape is going to be connected to the um, diagnosis. So let me run this. <clears throat> I'm going to resize this a bit. So essentially, it's the exact same output as uh, uh, the same structure as before. We have PC1 and PC2. But now we see that cluster one is basically all the red ones, and cluster two are all the green ones. And, and interestingly, we have the diagnosis B as the round ones, which are mostly, but not only, a green. And we have the M as triangle, and most of them, again, not all, uh, you can see there are some circles here, are um, in, in, in class of one. So in other words, it kind of works, but it definitely has, um, it's not the best possible um, case. So uh, now that we did that, we have the cluster, um, and we've sort of done a, a, a visual um, inspection, if you like, um, we can check how well they coincide with the labels that we do know. So eventually what we do need to do, uh, our goal um, is to create somehow a cluster that will correlate or at least connect well enough to the diagnosis. So we do have some labels and let's check about them. So in order to do that, we're going to be use a method called cross tabulation. So a cross tab is a table that allows you to read off how many data points in clusters one and two are actually benign or malignant um, respectively. And I'm going to use uh, the G models library. So going to load this and I'm going to create this cross table, which is the one that you see down here. Um, so the cell content, so it provides a, a bit of an index so that people can, can understand what it's all about. And um, basically it contains how many elements, this, the his square contribution and the number per row, per column and table in total. So you see that in cluster one, you have 356 that are uh, benign um, and 82 that are malignant. So the cluster one, if you see here, is basically the, the red case. And you have this um, distribution. Um, the second cluster basically relates a lot to what we said earlier, that um, we actually visually saw that we only have one that is um, benign here, and most of them are malignant. So in the second cluster, we have primarily uh, malignant cases. But all in all, it's not. Uh, the best distribution. Ideally, what we would have liked is to have um, the percentage of this one to be close to 100, the same as here, and this off-diagonal ones to be close to, to, to zero, if not that direct zero. Um, so this is a more numerical way of evaluating and um, understanding um, how the overall information works. So a question that 
need to be addressed is how well did the classroom work? And the short answer is, well, it, it kind of worked, but it's a way of um, to an ideal scenario. Uh, do bear in mind that um, k-means, by definition, does not create, does not decide on the number of, of clusters to be produced. In other words, you need to define k, the number of clusters. In our instance, what we did is define k as two, because um, we have two groups in diagnosis and we would like to have equal um, number of clusters if at all possible. Um, however, um, there is one technique um, that can be used to identify the best, the optimal K, if you like. And this is a, a, a method called the elbow method. So what it does, uh, it uses this um, within group homogeneity or within group um, heterogeneity, if you like, to evaluate the variability. So in other words, you're interested in the percentage of the variance explained by each cluster. You can expect that the variability to increase with the number of clusters or alternatively, the heterogeneity degrees. So it's, it's the more classes you create, uh, the more together the individual um, entities and the less of the variance you have. So our challenge is to find the K that is beyond the diminishing returns. So adding a new cluster does not improve in the variability of the data because very few information is left to explain. So in order to do that, I'm going to first create a function in R called K-mean within this. Um, and what it does, it calculates and computes the total within cluster sum of squares. Um, so if I try this with um, k equals two, and I run this, um, sorry, I have to run the function first. And um, this is the error that you see here. I, I asked the function, but it didn't exist. So if I run the k mean within, within this, and um, it gives me um, the value uh, that you see uh, that you see here. Um, however, what we need to do is test this n times. In order to do that, we're going to um, use s apply and run the same sort of function across a rather main range of k. Um, so let's set that we want to test until k equals 20. And I'm going to run this uh, from 2 up until this maximum k. So I can run this. It's, it's already done. And, um, and what I can do now is I'm going to create this kind of a data frame uh, with this information, this uh, WSS. Uh, and essentially what it will contain is uh, the actual K value and what was the within um, uh, the within this um, uh, capture of variance um, with uh, WSS uh, function. Now that we have the data, we can do some um, kind of plotting with ggplot. And I'm going to use uh, this new data frame called elbow um, a, a broad aesthetic, and I'm going to um, create sort of this particular um, uh, curve. Essentially, what it says is that with um, k equals two, we have uh, a high value of WSS. And as we expect, as we increase the number of, of clusters and we divide our original, so remember that k means is a divisive value, so it starts with a big one and then it cuts it again and again. So at some point, uh, by adding um, more uh, clusters, uh, we, 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 we don't gain anything both in heterogeneity and, 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 and anything else. So from the graph, what we can see is that uh, the point 10 is basically the point where we have basically diminishing returns. So we increase uh, the number of clusters, but we don't necessarily have a lower value of that, this is at least by a significant amount. So what we can do, and I will leave this as an exercise, is to rerun uh, the clustering step now with a, the new k, which is k equals 10, and try again the cross tab of the clustering in the known labels and see whether there has been an improvement of, of that. A second exercise that might be useful to try out is to try to think of alternative metrics that could be used as a distant measure. So in here, uh, k-means is using the default Euclidean distance. But it might be possible that in this particular instance, um, there is a data, another metric uh, that could be used in place uh, of the Euclidean one and of the Euclidean one and provide a better um, response of the k-means algorithm. So k-means clustering 
um, essentially requires us to specify the number of clusters. And as we've just seen, um, determining the optimal number of clusters is often not, not trivial. So hierarchical clustering, so it's another um, clustering method, uh, is an alternative approach which builds a hierarchy, as the name implies, from the bottom up. And it doesn't require us to specify the number of clusters beforehand, but it does require extra steps in order to extract the final clusters. So roughly put, the algorithm works as, as follows. Uh, put, the first of all, is to put its data point into its own cluster, and then identify the closest two clusters and combine them into one, and then repeat this step until all data points are in a single uh, big cluster. And um, when this is done, it is usually represented by a dendrogram-like structure. And then there are a few ways to determine how close two clusters are. You can use the complete linkage clustering. So essentially find the maximum possible distance between points belonging to two different clusters. A single linkage clustering. So find the minimum possible distance between points belonging to different clusters. Um, the mean linkage clustering. Find all possible um, pairwise distance for points belonging to two different clusters and then calculate the average. And then you have the centroid linkage clustering where you find the centroid of each cluster and calculate the distance between centroids of two clusters. And what we will do here is we will be applying again hierarchical clustering to our data set and see what the result might be. So do remember that our data set has some columns with nominal and um, the nominal, which is the categorical values in our instance, the identifier and diagnosis. So we will need to make sure that we only use the columns with numerical values. There are no missing values in the data sets we might, which might have created problems um, that we need to clean up before the clashing itself. Um, but again, we will need to do the scaling of the features and we need to normalize this. And um, so in order to do that, and so you get another method that the scaling can be done. Remember so far, um, if I'm scrolling a bit back on, on top, um, we've seen that we can use um, the, uh, the predict, the, the pre-process uh, function of Kare. We can um, do this directly through principal component analysis. And now we're going to use a, another function that is called um, scale, essentially. And what we're going to be using is our original data frame um, starting from column three onwards, convert to data frame and scale. And I'm going to run this. And now I can have a quick summary and you can see that basically the exact same information. Uh, you see that all of the, uh, the mean now is zero and then the variance and the um, extreme values are always um, a bit uh, comparable to, to each other. So now that we've done that, um, the next uh, process for any hierarchical algorithm is to actually calculate the distances. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to use again the Euclidean method as before. Uh, do bear in mind that um, the distance function can use pretty much um, a, a whole set of, of different um, uh, 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 distance metrics. Uh, so please feel free to, to um, if you like, uh, play out with them. Um, just uh, to mention a few, um, uh, aside the Euclidean, you have the Maximum, the Manhattan, Canberra, Binary, and Minkowski. Um, and uh, these uh, all have a um, occasionally significant effect to how the overall clustering has uh, will, will be performed. So the next step is to actually perform the hierarchical clustering. And in order to do that, I'm going to use uh, the eight cluster function. Um, and again, I'm going to use the average method. As I said earlier, the average method means that it finds all possible pairwise distance for points belonging to two different clusters, and then it calculates the, the average. Um, there are additional linkage methods um, like Ward and um, Ward D2, single, complete, um, acuity, the median, centroid, and, and so forth. The average linkage method, um, for those who are more um, uh, aware of, 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 of um, phylogenetics, for example, is closer to the UPGMA um, approach. So I'm going to, um, to, to run this. Um, it runs um, quite fast because it's a rather small data set. Um, so it doesn't uh, have a lot of expectations. And now I can do a very, very simple plot by saying basically plot um, and, and this tree. And, and, and this is what is actually being produced, um, which is um, 
and basically we, we do see this um, hierarchy. We see that all, it's, it's a bit of a mess here. Uh, so if you zoom this in, you will be able to see more information. But essentially you see that every single um, entity starts as its own um, cluster. And then moving upwards, we see that mer they merge again and again. And well, until you get to this point where you actually have a, a big um, single, um, single cluster. So what we can and what we should do is to um, try to figure out what is the desired number of clusters. So um, by looking at the actual dendrogram here, uh, we can see that depending on where we want to cut this tree, uh, you might have completely different um, uh, clusters. So if I cut it up here, I'm going to have two clusters. If I'm going to cut here, I'm going to have uh, I'll uh, do a quick assessment of about um, six, um, give or take. So what we're going to do is I'm going to use the cut tree function, um, and I'm going to specify um, that I want to cut this um, in um, some way so that we can create two groups. So I'm going again to define that I want two clusters. Uh, if I run this, Nothing will be shown because this is run on, on, on the back end eventually. But what I'm going to do, I can um, request to plot this again. I'm putting some more comments here that can be used. So what is the K? What is the border? What is which? If I'm going to run this, it's going to create um, sort of a um, uh, two, two different boxes. Um, the big green one and a very narrow red one that you might be able to see if I slightly do that. You might see a very sort of small red box here. Um, plus, it's going to draw um, this kind of a dotted line uh, that is approximately where um, this, is, this is cut. So I, this is, is something like predefined, this 18. Uh, because again, by visually speaking, this is roughly when it's going to, to, uh, to be cut in order to achieve that. Um, so we see how these two clusters are in different um, colored boxes. But as you can also uh, imagine, this is not the best way to um, visualize uh, the overall information. So what I can do is I'm going to use a dedicated function, um, a library called dedextend which is actually dedicated to creating uh, dendrograms. Um, and what I'm going to do here, uh, let me have this in a more um, easy way for people to see. Um, I'm going to plot this, but now I'm going to be able to color um, the branches based on the actual cluster. So you see um, that all branches that correspond to the second cluster are now this green. And again, um, uh, the very few that are um, in the first cluster, uh, you see that they are um, in colored in, 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 in red. So this is, again, and it also, also um, provides this context of this is the first class and this is the second process, cluster. Um, we can change also the way that these, um, the, the branches are colored. For example, um, by having a look, into how our um, uh, how the prognosis um, actually fits there. So what I'm going to do instead of um, uh, coloring the branches based on on, on k equals two, I'm going to color the branches based on um, the diagnosis as the you know, as the as the point of, of the coloring. So um, I'm going to run this again. I'm going to create yet another diagram right here, and this time around, uh, it's interesting to see that the two different um, types of, of diagnosis are indicated in different colors. Also, it's interesting to see um, that although there is a slightly redder area here and a slightly greener area over here, um, there is, in this particular hierarchical fashion, there is not a distinct um, splitting of the diagnosis versus, um, uh, uh, of, of the diagnosis in, in the two different, um, two different categories. So essentially, this is an indication that uh, we might need to figure out a different way of performing the character clustering, maybe by using different metrics or um, different um, uh, or different linking methods in order to produce the actual clusters eventually. 
Um, as a final point, um, and before we move on from the uh, from the clustering, um, it might be useful to do also the same exercise that we did earlier, um, where we uh, utilize the principal component um, aspect uh, plotting, and instead of using the k-means as our um, as our uh, driver, are going to use the um, output of of of, of the hierarchical clustering. So I'm going to run this again. Um, the back end is going to be again um, the, um, the hierarchical, the, the, the principal components one and two, as we created way before. Um, again, diagnosis based on the shape, so uh, benign and malignant. And you can see that cluster one um, is um, all those numbers and all those points. And number two is basically one, two, three elements that we see up here. Uh, so again, uh, we can do again the cross tab and see how these are um, uh, fit. But I'm, I'm I'm sure that everyone will kind of agree that this is not um, the best possible hierarchical clustering. So so far, and and this is sort of exercise that I will urge you to, to try out based on on all we've seen here. Um, we only use two methods: so Euclidean for the distance and average for the linking. So I would really uh, recommend that you try experiment with different methods and see whether the final results um, improve. And the second point is, um, after selecting those two methods, um, which are the more appropriate ones, um, the cutoff selection that we did for k equals two was optimally, obviously not the optimal one. Um, so try using different cutoffs uh, to ensure that the final clustering could provide some context as to the original question. And again, the original question here is, um, what would be the appropriate clustering so that we can find a, a better um, split of our data points and that reflects the diagnosis. So what we've seen so far is um, essentially the um, uh, loading the data, doing some exploratory data analysis, and then we tried a bit of a clustering. So let's move to the next part, which is um, talk about supervised learning. So um, supervised learning is the branch of machine learning that involves predicting labels, such as survived or not survived, um, malignant versus benign, and so forth. Um, such models learn from label data, which is essentially the data that includes whether a passenger survived, um, and, and this is called uh, this process calls, called is called uh, model training, uh, and then based on this uh, model, uh, you try to do a prediction on data that you have no label about. Uh, they are generally called um, training test sets, in uh, if the ones that we are going to be using, because what you want to do, and this is a key element, is that you want to build a model that learns some patterns on a training set, and then you want to use this new model to make predictions on the data points of the test set that the model has not seen at all. Uh, and based on, on, on this prediction, um, you can calculate uh, the percentage of the test set labels that you uh, actually got correct. And this is known as um, roughly the accuracy of your model. So um, as, as you probably know um, from the introduction so far, a good way to approach supervised learning is basically to do this EDA, the Explorer Data Analysis and Dataset, um, create a quick and dirty model, or if you like, a baseline model, which can serve as a comparison against later models um, that you will build. Um, and then you attract this process, you might need to do some more um, Explorer Data Analysis and yet another model. Um, at some point, you need to engineer features. So either take the features that you already have and combine them or extract more information from them or create a subset of them and eventually come to the last point, which is get a model that performs better. Um, as you can see, um, it's not a, um, a run something and, 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 and let go. It's more of a really iterative and investigative process. A common practice in all supervised learning is the construction and the use of these train and test data sets. Um, essentially what this process does, it takes all the input, it randomly splits it into the two data sets in the training and the test one, and then you can proceed through that. Usually, uh, the ratio is, of course, up to the individual researcher, the, the, the person who is doing the, the machine learning. 
and, and can be anything from an 80% training set and 22 uh, test, 70-30, 60-40, or even 50-50. It, it's completely an up to the researcher. And at some point, it might also be di dictated um, by the distributions of, of the classes of information under um, the data set. So looking for the supervised learning um, the, and, and looking for classification as our first task, um, there are various classifiers available. We have the decision trees, uh, we have naive base classifiers, we have the KNN classifiers, and we have the subtract machines. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to be showing here um, uh, tree-based approaches. And, and we'll start with the decision trees um, first. So a decision tree is a, um, a, a type uh, of supervised learning where it can work for both um, for any type of, of variable, so both a numeric and, and categorical one. And with this method, what it does, um, it splits the population into two or more homogeneous sets based on particular feature. And um, it is based on the most significant um, differentiator, splitter, if you like, of the input variables. So the decision tree is a very powerful nonlinear classifier. And what it does, it creates eventually a tree, um, a, a tree-like structure that generates this relationship between the various features and the potential outcomes. And every time it has a decision, it creates sort of a branching one. Um, and this is sort of a, the core structure. So there are two types of decision trees. We have the categorical ones, and this is basically the usual classification where and the decision tree has a categorical target variable. In other words, survive or not, malignant or benign. So different types of labels, if you like. And you have the continuous ones, um, which um, the decision tree, the ultimate point is to have a continuous target. So what is the value of, 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 of your label? And, and the usual case here is a regression. I'm going to get to the regression in, in, in a bit. So let's start with a classification tree where we are going to be aiming for diagnosis on our, on, our, on, our, on our case. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to, uh, let's create some space first. Let's start with classification now. Uh, and um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to create the training and test asset. I'm going to use um, set seed to a thousand. Again, feel free to use the exact same seed so that we have the exact same data sets. Um, and the first row here, I'm going to create um, a um, index of whether um, a particular entry, a data point in my original data set will be going to um, group one or group two with a probability of 70% of, 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 um, of train and 30% um, test. And based on these indexes, I'm going to create these two data sets. Um, let's see that we can find them here as well. Um, there we go, we have the test and the train, and we see that the train set head bias has about 400 observations and about 180 are in, in the test one. So we created sort of our, um, or our main part. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to use the R part library, uh, which will help me um, create a decision tree. I'm going to load it. And the first thing I need to do is to actually define a formula. In other words, um, how do I want to evaluate? What are the key elements that I find um, relevant to uh, identify diagnosis? So in this case, I specify a formula that says that my, I want to uh, classify my diagnosis label based on the radius mean, area mean, and texture standard error and columns of, of my data set. Of course, this is something that I put hard-coded in, and it's quite easy um, to create um, anything. So for example, um, if I want to take into consideration all the columns, um, I could equally well uh, put a point. So a diagnosis as a, as, a, as a function of all my columns, dot represents the all columns here. Uh, but mostly so that we can keep um, the example short and, and, and understandable and, and to be discussed. And um, I'm going to use this particular um, constraint um, formula. So let's try this. And now I have my, my formula here. So I'm going to now um, run the, um, the modeling part. So I'm going to use the R part. I'm going to define um, my formula as the way I want to do classification. I'm going to use a train 
data set as, as an input. And then I'm going to use um, uh, to specify some of the additional parameters um, that are specifically the mean split, which is basically what is the minimum number of data points in a node so that it is possible to be split. Uh, what is uh, the mean bucket is the minimum allowed number of instances of data points in its leaf of the tree. So when we get to the leaf, to the very bottom of the tree, uh, what is the minimum number of data points that can go there? The max depth is essentially what is um, the maximum depth that the tree can go. And CP is basically a contour parameter, uh, complexity. So essentially, um, it's, this is set rather intuitively. So essentially, the larger the value of the CP, the more probable it's, it is for the tree to be pruned. So branches and, 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 um, and, um, and leaves will be uh, will be cut off. So I'm going to run this. Um, it's already been um, executed. So what I, it's now, it would be nice to do now is to first of all print um, the CP table and have information about what is the content. And here you see the different values of the CP, what's the error, and what are the number of, number of splits that have been done in its in its iteration up until we get to the point of of minus one, which is which is here. Uh, but more interestingly. Um, I think it is to actually see the tree itself. So what I'm asking here is to plot the tree. And this is what we actually get. So this is a quite interesting, um, interesting table. So what it contains is basically information from um, um, sorry, for some reason, um, I, I stopped um, sharing my screen. And so essentially what you see is in each point, in each node, there's a particular question, which is, for example, the question here is, um, is the area mean value less than 606? If it's yes, we go to this subtree. If it's no, we go to this subtree. Um, the color of each node corresponds to the two classes, B and M. And um, depending on, on how uh, prominent um, the uh, each value is, you see um, whether, um, uh, whether it's uh, B or, or M. It's not the best um, uh, tree itself. Um, so um, what we can do is we can select a tree with a minimum prediction error. In order to do that, I can use um, an optimization process where I'm going to select from the CP table that we've just printed out, the one that actually contains the mean in the, um, in the error. So here um, you might find that this is not the best one. And if you actually look at that, you see that there is one option up here that the error is lower than those values. So I'm going to use this one. And I'm going to identify what is the CP. And we see that the CP value is actually the one that we've saw here. And um, we're going to prune the tree based on, on, on this particular value. And I'm going to print it out again. Um, so technically, uh, although this is a cut tree from what we saw before, um, the actual um, accuracy that is predicted is, is much more efficient. And again, um, it is with um, the understanding that I'm only using these three variables here to do a prediction. So it's a very limited assumption from, from the get-go. I'm, I'm here um, showing how this can be performed. Um, and I can also create a table here, a confusion table, if you like, um, that is using um, um, it is representing how the different uh, types of classes are represented across the different um, models. So there is there are eight instances of uh, malignant has been misclassified as a B9, and 35 cases of B9 has been misclassified as malignant based on this particular uh, variable um, only. So um, this is our, um, our our model, right? We haven't tried it yet. So the next step is now that we have the model, uh, we should check how the prediction works in our test data set. So now we actually want to make a prediction. Um, it's, it's a prediction because the test data set that we are using here, um, the model has not seen yet. We know the labels, so we can assess it, uh, but it's not something that we, 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 we know. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to run this, and we can have um, this plot and the actual confusion table as well. So in the confusion table, we get 
pretty much what we expected also from the model because it's not it was not the best one. Um, the benign ones, this is a visual representation of the confusion table, so it's easy to find the correlation one to another. So only two of the malignant um, cases have been misassigned as benign, and only 15 of the benign has been misassigned as, as malignant. So overall, um, it is a, um, a good model, let's say, but it has definitely room for improvement. So a key, some quick key, key questions that I would like to, to, to ask you as, as kind of an exercise is that, what are the key parameters that have been, um, that will have the most impact here? So far we've played basically with the CP only as a way to minimize the error, but there are also different parameters here like the max depth, the min split and the min bucket that we haven't tried at all. So I would definitely urge you to try those um, a bit more. A second point is that, so far, we've been using only three of the variables of our entire model. So um, if we put all of the uh, features together, what would be the impact of, of our prediction? Would we be improved or it would be worsened? Um, and the follow-up question with that would be, is this a good plan or a bad plan? Um, and uh, what I would really like to urge you is to go back also and try to remember the things that we've discussed in the beginning of this tutorial, uh, which are related to the um, information about um, the feature engineering uh, and the principal model analysis, as well as identifying which might be the relevant features to select. So um, this is a sort of exercise that are linked also onto the um, Galaxy Train Network tutorial, um, and you can find more information there as well. So let's move to another type of decision trees. Um, and it's probably one that you've heard um, already a few times um, in your work, which is called random forests. So random forest is an ensemble learning technique. Um, ensemble means that essentially it constructs multiple decision trees. Um, each tree is trained with a random sample of the training data set and on a randomly chosen subspace. So essentially randomly chosen features of, 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 of the data set. Uh, the final prediction is derived from the prediction of all individual trees. And then you can have um, either a, a mean, if you're talking about regression, or a majority voiding if you're talking about classification. Um, the advantage is that it has better performance and it's very likely, it's less likely to overfit um, your data uh, than a single decision tree. However, a key um, disadvantage of a random forest is that it has much lower interpretability. So as opposed to a tree like this one, where we can actually see why there is a choice from here and there, <clears throat> whether it makes sense or not, different question. Um, in a random forest, this is uh, not really an option. There are several libraries that provide the functionality for a random forest. <clears throat> in this instance, we are going to be using the random forest library. Um, it has some uh, advances, which is um, it is quite fast um, and can work with um, limited memory, but it cannot handle data with missing values. Um, it, <clears throat> it has a limit to um, 32 as the maximum number of different types of a variable, if it's a categorical one. Um, and it does have some extensions that help that. So um, the extended force and the gradient force are, are some of them. Uh, if you look for additional functions that do uh, random forest, I can um, recommend the party C forest one, which does not have these um, limits, but at the same time, it's rather slow compared to the random forest and it does require a bit more of memory. So again, I'm going to be using, um, I'm going to load the random forest. I'm going to set the seed to a thousand and I'm going to um, train um, my random forest. Let's create some space here. And I'm going to use random forest. Um, and here I'm going to be using all my variables because it doesn't make sense to limit them um, prior to our work because um, random forest, as I said before, uh, by definition, what it tries to do is to find a um, random sample of the training data and then a randomly selected subset of, of the column. So I'm going to use all of them in this particular instance. Uh, so let me run this. Um, and as soon as it's done, uh, the next step is to actually um, do a quick kind of a confusion matrix to see uh, what is the output. 
as you can see, it is slightly improved from the um, uh, decision tree that we tried earlier um, of the diagonal we have on the 8 and 11 corresponding from those two points. And um, so it is, again, um, slightly better than, than the previous one. We can also check what the actual content of the random forest is. Um, so if I'm going to run this, let me push this a bit up. Um, it gives an, uh, information about um, the tree itself. We used 100 different um, trees. In each split of the tree, we, um, we selected, the, it was selected only five of the variables. Um, and this is a confusion mark that we, we tried ever. You see the classification error that is 3% uh, and about 10% um, in, uh, respectively. So it is, um, it, it has uh, room for, for improvement. We can also see the overall performance of the model um, by plotting this information. And you can see how the error across different trees um, is actually changing. Remember that this tries a lot of different trees with several different subsets of both the training set and of the features uh, trying to identify what would be the optimal. Well, in all cases, we see that the error um, ranges between um, 005 and 010 um, with um, the red and green sort of um, showing what is the, um, uh, is, the, is, the, is the overall performance. A key element of the random forest is that it actually gives us the, um, the option of reviewing which of the variables has had the largest, uh, the highest importance, where importance in our instance is the impact to the performance of the model. In order to do that, we use the importance uh, random forest, and it actually prints out down here um, the, uh, the whole list of all um, the, uh, the, the features that have been used. And um, here is the corresponding um, Gini index, so a, a way of assigning this, this information. We can do this also by um, using the, um, the variance uh, importance. So in this particular uh, plot, what we have is, uh, let me try to resize this a bit more. We have again um, the features and for each of those features. So because um, this is a, a short space, um, it does not list all 32 of, of the variables. There's, there is some overlap. So only some of them are being seen. Uh, but these are actually all 32 points. And here you can see basically what, is, what, are, what are considered uh, the most important um, uh, features out of those, uh, of those ones. So this is also one way that we can kind of select um, the, um, the most interesting features, if you like, or the most important ones in terms of impact to the, um, to the model. So let's actually take this model that we just created, the random one, uh, the random forest one, and let's do a prediction. Again, I'm going to use the predict, and I'm going to um, create a table, which is down here. And we can see that in terms of the testing data set, it actually improved much better. There has been mo no misclassification on the benign, and only four uh, were misclassified in, in the other one. So um, if I'm trying to, um, to plot this as information, um, it tries to um, plot this particular um, value. And we can see basically um, the different um, aspects of, of diagnosis. And you can see how they are um, improving across different, um, different data points. Um, we can also try to evaluate based on, um, on the predicted performance models with reduced numbers of variables based on the ones that are um, uh, ranked by their importance. So in order to do that, I'm going to use again the um, random forest, but with cross-validation. And this time I'm going to use a cross-validation of, of three. And now I'm going again to um, ask um, to show the results. And we can see that um, this time around, uh, we can see that um, the error is it's, it's much lower if cross-validation has been proved. So basically cross-validation means that and every time a, uh, our data set is being um, changed uh, as a train and test uh, and does the iteration uh, multiple different times in order to produce the, uh, the final model. So with that, um, it, it, the baseline here is that you can also use the random forest for feature selection. And based on the features that have been selected as more important, you can additionally move further with more um, with different type of, of, of models for the classification itself. So 
The final part of, of this tutorial is going to be discussing about regression. In particular, we're going to be uh, looking at the linear regression. So linear regression is essentially a, um, a model uh, that tries to predict the response with a linear function of the predictors, with the predictors being our, our particular columns. The most commonly used function in R for this is LM. Um, and um, it is extensively used um, in, in, in machine learning as well. In our data set, again, let's try to um, investigate the relationship between um, three of our variables. Let's go for radius mean, concave points mean, and area mean. Um, we can try to have a quick understanding of um, how those variables are correlated to each other by using correlation. Um, so if I'm going to run this, it gives me this particular value. If I'm going to run this, it gives me this particular value. So essentially, what it does say here is that they are somewhat, somewhat um, correlated. So let's try, first of all, to create a smaller um, subset of our data set, um, the BC one. Essentially, we're going to select only these three variables. So as you can see, I create a new subset here called BC, and I'm, going, I'm using only the, um, the three variables out of, of that. Um, and now let's build a linear regression model with a function LM using um, this particular data set, the, the BC1. Uh, as you can see, I'm using the full data set, so I haven't yet split it into training and test, mostly because I want to highlight how this, um, this, um, this, this works. So I can uh, print the contents of, of, the, uh, of the model itself, and it gives me some information about um, uh, how the uh, overall um, structure of, of, the, um, of, of the linear model is, is being done. So what it tells us here are what are the coefficients of the concave points mean and the area mean in the linear equation that connects them to the radius mean. Um, let's see now if we can predict the mean radius of a new sample. Let's say that we create a new sample um, that does not exist anymore, uh, that doesn't exist at all, and has a, um, a value of, of, of 2.72 and an area mean of 00964. In order to do that, I'm going to, um, uh, first of all, create a prediction model. Um, so I'm going to use this model that we had and do a prediction. And based on the prediction, um, I can try to do a, um, a plotting of that and see how, how well this, this works. So I'm going to um, do a plot. And this is what is going, what is being produced. So these are all different points. And I've also added a line from zero to one, mostly to give an indication of how, um, how they could potentially fit in, into, into a single line. We can also have a better look of what the regression model actually contains by using a summary. So the summary provides some more context into, um, uh, into the linear model itself with some also um, standard error and some p-values which have um, the significant code list here. And you can see that roughly all of these points are falling on the same, um, same line. Um, and these are basically um, with a probability of not being on the line um, quite low. So on average, um, it is a, um, a good enough um, connection here. However, uh, this only provides an evaluation of the whole data set. Um, that we've actually used for the training. We don't know how well this linear model will perform on an unknown data set. So let's go back to the original plan of splitting our data sets into a training and a test set and create the model on the training set and then visualize the predictions. Uh, again, I'm going to do, um, let's scroll this a bit down. I'm going to set the seed again uh, to one, two, three. Um, again, I'm going to create indexes. I'm going to use a different probability of splitting the trend and test to 75% and 25% respectively. And I'm going to create two different um, data sets, the BC train and the BC test. Both of them are now using um, only the, um, the three columns uh, that we've discussed before um, that we are playing around with, if you like. Um, based on that, let's create now the um, uh, the linear regression model. And this time around, we're using it only for the train data set. And we can also have a quick summary of the model itself and see how it actually behaves. Let me scroll this a bit down again. 
and see that it actually is not have um, much of a significance, or much of a difference to, to, to the previous um, when we're going, when we're using the entire person. Um, we can do a, a visual evaluation. So let's do the predictions and put them in a different model. And I'm going to run this and I'm going to save them in the predicted model of the um, breast cancer. And let's now do a printing um, of what it actually um, is um, the truth um, with a prediction. And we see now that it actually follows um, pretty much the, the, same, the same line. Um, this is quite similar to when using the, um, the, uh, the whole data set. So this is um, fairly um, well done. Now, let's go ahead and actually use the trained data set that we haven't tried at all. I'm going to run this. And I'm going to um, try to get to, to, to review um, the, um, the... So the error that has been produced is because I haven't yet done um, the prediction of the test. I have done prediction of the train, but not the test. So I'm going to run this. Now I have the information of the prediction for the test, and now I can run this, and we will create um, a new line. Again, as we can see, it actually follows um, the, uh, the information rather well. We can also use um, uh, the root mean square error and the R square metrics to evaluate our model on the training and the test set. Um, so let's actually go ahead and, and do that. Um, let's create the residuals first. So I'm going to um, run this, um, this, this function based on the train set. And let's calculate um, the um, root mean um, square error as a result here. and um, and also um, the standard deviation of the actual outcome um, here. So these are the results that you can see um, down, down there. As we can see, our uh, root mean square error is very small compared to standard deviation. So um, basically, we can say that this is a, uh, a good, enough, uh, good enough model. So um, closing this um, tutorial, I would also recommend that you try the same process and comparing to um, uh, quadrate the uh, root mean square for the test data and check whether the model is overfit or not. And again, what we want to check here is um, to uh, check the R square value and see whether this is close to, to, to one. That's the, the important element. Um, another option that we can try here is to try different variables of the original model and see whether the disease can be um, overall improved and have different perspectives. Again, overall, um, the linear regression is an effective way of predicting um, a, a, a real value, um, not a categorical one uh, for, for classification. So um, with that, I would like to, to close this tutorial. I would uh, recommend that you um, check out the information um, and the, all the commands are listed explicitly on, on, the, um, on the Galaxy Train Network tutorial. And you can go through that um, at your own pace and you can refer to this video at any point for clarifications. Um, I would thank again, um, both the Galaxy Train Network team, uh, the Galaxy Project for um, uh, supporting this and of course, Elixir um, that, he, that put together the original material on, on machine learning in R, which is here. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. And I'm seeing one of the other videos.